couple of years ago. There's a university in California called Chaplin, Chapman University. They initiated a study. It was kind of a first of its kind, a study about the fears of Americans. And, and the survey showed that Americans were afraid or concerned about things like walking alone at night, becoming the victim of identity theft, of being a victim of a random or, or mass shooting, having their identity stolen, running out of money in the future, and government surveillance of internet activity. Maybe you have some of those fears too. The study went on to, to, to look into what people uh, thought about crime, things they were afraid of, and they found that Americans were worried or concerned about school shootings, about human trafficking, about gang violence and uh, pedophilia and sexual assault and child abduction. But those weren't the only things that Americans were afraid of. Americans were afraid of of natural disasters, I mean, things like Hurricane Katrina and tornadoes that would come our way, earthquakes and floods like we just had, a uh, pandemic or major uh, sickness or illness that would come, and even power outages. Well, I'm not sure that it's really necessary for me to try to convince you that we live in troubled times, but those fears and concerns kind of remind us that we actually do. And I probably could have just done this. I could have listed a handful of events that have occurred over the last two decades. A and you would be reminded of the difficult days in which we live. And remember, this survey was not a Christian survey. So if we looked further into the moral and spiritual decline that's taking place in our world, we would further declare that we live in troubled times. Well, David faced troubled times. He faced troubled times as an individual, and the nation of Israel faced troubled times. And today I want you to turn with me to Psalm 11. Psalm 11. And to hear the words of King David. Psalm 11. It's during one of these times of crisis that David writes these words that encourage us to stand firm in troubled times. Listen to what David says. Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the heart, the dark, the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Now, there are four important features of standing firm in troubled times that we find in this, in this psalm. And the first one is this. We are, as Christians, to run from sin and not to run from the culture. As Christians, we are called to run from sin but not from the culture. In the midst of this crisis, David declares that he's going to take refuge in the Lord. But all along, as soon as he makes that statement of confidence, he hears voices. Now, we're not told whether the voice that he hears is his own internal voice or if it is the voice, perhaps, of his advisors that are around him. But nonetheless, he hears the voices 
And these voices are encouraging him to flee. Look at the logic. Basically, they say here, the wicked are going to destroy you. So David, here's the deal. You need to run because of, number one, the wicked are going to destroy you. And look what it says, how they're going to destroy you. It says, it says that they have bent their bow. They've already got the arrow pulled back. I mean, they're ready to go. And it's saying that even in the dark, even in the darkness of the times, even the darkness of the soul, that here they're getting ready to just send off a volley of arrows. And that those arrows are going to hit the righteous. And so the logic is, hey, if you're the wicked are going to kill you, then get out of Dodge. But that's just the first part of the logic. The second part of the logic is this. The foundations are, the, are destroyed. The foundations are destroyed. What do we mean by foundations? What is David talking about? Well, David is not talking about the foundation of a building per se. David is talking about the foundations of a nation or a culture. And foundations are simply the ground rules for a society. Just the most basic ground rules for how people exist and, and live together. And so the voices are saying, hey, look, why stand firm? It's futile. They're going to attack you. Everything that you believe in, everything that's going on, everything's being destroyed that you know. So just, just run away. Just flee. Go to the mountains like a bird. Just fly away. You know, there is a form of Christianity that, that emphasizes one part of Scripture that says, and we know it does, Come out from among them and be ye separate. It says that in the Bible. But they pit that verse over another part of Scripture that says that we are in the world, but not of the world. Separation from the world is a good thing when it means that we live holy lives and do not follow the world's way of living. But separation uh, is a bad thing if we seclude ourselves from the world so that we are no eternal good to the world that we live in. See, God wants us to run from sin, but not from the culture. The, the culture that we live in, it needs Christians to stand firm in the midst of a corrupt culture. I mean, how will they ever hear the gospel and see the gospel unless they hear it from us and see it in us? So be in the world, but don't be like the world. And we get that kind of confused sometimes as Christians, don't we? Sometimes we start acting like the world. Don't follow the sinful ways of the world, but don't run. Stand firm. This is what David is saying. He's going to stand firm. So don't run from the culture. Run from sin, but don't run from the culture. Second, second feature about standing firm. He mentioned foundations here. Well, here's the deal. The foundations of our culture may be destroyed, but our foundation stands as the people of God. David's advisor said, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the, and the question demands an answer, right? And the answer for them is, the righteous can't do anything about it. So just flee to the mountain. Now there may be a time to flee to the mountains. Matter of fact, in David's own life, there were times where David actually did flee. Jesus actually says that related to his second coming, there's a time will come when he says the thing to do is flee to the mountains. But David says at this point in time with what's going on, this is not the time to run. And folks, I'm telling you just based on where we are today as a culture, now is not the time to run. Now is the time to stand firm. Because the culture does not determine our foundation as the people of God. There's no doubt about it. Our culture has become immoral. 
Our culture has become godless. Our culture is corrupt and spiritually deficient. And we should not be surprised that when the foundation of truth is eroded, that the foundations of our society are destroyed. Here's just a few signs. Here's just a few signs that our foundations, our ground rules are being destroyed. Number one, objective morality is disintegrating. What do I mean by that? Objective morality is disintegrating. Well, here's, here, here's what I mean. I mean, this right here is God's Word. And we believe that God's Word is true. Through and through. True. That it doesn't change. That God's truth doesn't change. But we live in a culture where truth is fluid. Truth is not objective. Truth is subjective. <coughs> according to our culture. So that you might say, well, that might be wrong for you, but it's right for me. And that might be true over here, but it's not true over there. Truth becomes fluid, subjective. That's one sign that our foundations are, are being destroyed. Here's another sign that our foundations are being destroyed. The family itself is being destroyed. We see this all over, right? Marriage is rejected. Marriage is rejected. A, a great number of people in our culture today have rejected marriage, and we see it because they live together, they'll have kids together, but they will not become husband and wife. We live in a society where, where gender is deconstructed. Gender is deconstructed. It says in the book of Genesis that God created man in his image. Male and female created he them. Very distinct genders. Male and female. Not accidental. Again, not subjective. But the culture we live in today is deconstructing gender. And children in our culture today are not taught to submit to authority. To authority. Matter of fact, if you think about it, how could they? If there's no objective truth, what authority would they submit to? Because if what's true for you might not be true for me, might not be true for that person over there, then who, where is authority? Is there any authority? So you see, it's very clear that the foundations that, of our culture are being destroyed. One final sign. And we'll get to hear from uh, Darla from Marsha's place next week. So I hope you'll come back to the missions conference and, and hear from her. Just, just one of the speakers. But, but when we see our culture's foundation being destroyed, we see life is devalued. Life is devalued. So that when we look at the issue of abortion and the unborn, we live in a culture that since 1973 has, has simply said, well... If you don't want a child, get rid of it. Life devalued. Not only from, from the cradle, but all the way to the grave. I guess as each year as I get older, this becomes more real to me, right? You know? That at some point in our culture, We've got to the point where there's multiple states now who allow assisted suicide. So an elderly person, the question is, is their life even worth it? Where they might even be encouraged to take their own life. Friends, God's word says that we are valuable to God. We are made in His image. We are unique. We are God's special creation. We are not animals. We're not trees. We're not rocks. We're not. We are human beings made in the image of our Creator. And one of the clear signs that our society is its foundations are, are just being demolished is that life is devalued. The very life that God gives to us is, is devalued. See, the foundations of the culture. Uh, are being destroyed. 
But there is hope. There is hope for the people of God. For our foundation as the people of God, it never was the culture, right? I mean, we, we are blessed to, to live in a society called the United States of America that was created itself out of biblical foundations. But, but our foundation was never the culture we live in. Our foundation was always something else. And so David, look what he says. Look at verse 4. You know, they say, foundation being destroyed, what can you do? This is what David says, the Lord is in his holy temple. He said, what does the foundations really have to do with anything at all? Our foundation is God. And where is he? Well, he's unshaken. The, the foundations might be shaken, but our God is not shaken. He is, he is there in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven, and he sees all this. He sees all this that is going on, and, and so our foundation is God. Amen? It's God. It's not the culture. So he has given us his truth and his written word. He has given us his truth and the God-man who is truth, Jesus Christ. And our God-given ground rules, they're still in place, regardless of what the culture does. Well, regardless. They can throw away truth. They can throw away family. They can throw away life. But as the people of God, our foundation stands. Our foundation stands. The foundations of the culture may, demol may be demolished, but our foundation as the people of God stands in God. And it's in Him alone that we can take refuge. He is righteous. And He loves those who live in righteousness. And our foundation stands even when the culture goes away from the truth of God. You know, I'm reminded of the parable that Jesus told as a part of his sermon on the mount. You may remember you had in that, in that story, you had a wise man and a foolish man. And, and you may recall that the foolish man, they were both building houses, right? But the, the foolish man, he built a house and he built it on on sinking sand. I mean, it was a sandy a foundation. And as the story goes, the, the storms came up, the floods came up, the rains came down, and, and his, his house didn't survive. But there was a wise man. There was a wise man. And the wise man built his house on a solid rock foundation. And in the context of what Jesus is sharing the, the difference between the two is that the one foundation is built on the truth and the revelation of God. And the other one's foundation is built on the sinking sand of our own humanity, our own wisdom. But the storm comes on the wise man's house. And because his house is built on the foundation of the rock, the rocky foundation, the floods come, the rains come down, and, and his house stands. Friends, we all know as, as human beings that the world around us, it's a shaky place. It's a shaky place. It's an uncertain place. But friends, if our foundation is the truth of God and the God of truth, it doesn't matter what happens to the culture around us, we can stand. And we don't have to take tuck tail and run. We stand firmly on what God says in His Word. Yes, we can declare that we live in troubled times. We can declare that the foundations are being destroyed, but we can't run away, and we must rest assured God is still in control. God is still on His throne. God is still in His holy temple. God is still righteous. He sees all, and He is over all. So, we are not to run from the culture, but we are to run from sin. And yes, the foundations of our culture are being destroyed, but our foundation stands as the people of God, and our foundation is God himself. But there's more to this story. It says there in verse 4, his eyes see, his, his eyelids test the children of man. And then it gets a little more specific in, in verse 5. It says, the Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. And then it says, Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their 
cup. The theme in these next verses is really the idea of fire. The idea of fire. You see, because God will, will, will rain down judgment on the wicked, and God will rain down eternal blessing on the righteous. But before the, the righteous experience the eternal blessing, they too will feel the heat of God's fire. But there's two different kinds of, of fire. And it's here that David makes it clear that in his understanding, he knows that from God, from God's truth, that, that God's disposition, his attitude towards sin, that it stands. God stands against sin and God loves righteousness. It, it, it's just that simple. And the immediate crisis helps him see the big picture. He's stepping back on all these. When you look at this, he's stepping back and he sees what's going on. And he realizes that, that whatever the crisis is for him as a follower of God, that this is a test or a trial for him. So there, there's the fires of testing that the believer goes through. Many of you have experienced this. Many of you have experienced this in your life. Like, why, Lord, why? Why, why do I gotta go, what do I got to go through this? But did you know that this testing is a refining fire in your life? It's meant to expose the reality that you are His kid. He's, he's testing the righteous. And, and we should not be surprised when we face temptation. We should not be surprised when we face trials. And sometimes those trials, they're individual. Like, you know, sometimes we, we, we ask for prayer requests and we have unspoken prayer requests. They're, they're, they're individual and maybe nobody really knows. But sometimes we experience trials as, as a church, uh, corporately, as a nation even. But David is experiencing these trials and, and we're in a troubled time. So David also sees that as much as God loves those who exhibit righteousness, he also sees that God is in opposition to those who are wicked and reject God. There's a different kind of fire that awaits those who love violence and those who live in wickedness. A fire of judgment. He says, let him rain coals on the wicked. And so at the present time, it appears that the wicked go on in their wickedness and that God does not even seem to care. But this is not true. For as fire rained down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah, God will again rain down fire in judgment on the wicked. In the old King James, it spoke here of fire and brimstone. I know we live in a day and age where we're preaching about fire and brimstone. People don't want to hear about that. But God's Word talks about it. And if, if we go on living in, in a wicked life, we will face God's judgment. Just as surely as the fires of trials test the believer, the fires of judgment will rain down on those who reject God and live their own way. No one can hide from God. All of our deeds are ever before Him. And we will either be exposed as righteous in Christ by the refining fire of God that tests us, or we will be exposed as wicked by the righteous and fiery wrath of God. Friends, this, this is why the gospel message is so important. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be uh, sitting here experiencing the fiery wrath of God raining down on me. Do you? But that's what the gospel message is about. Jesus came. Jesus died on the cross. He experienced the wrath of God so that you and I don't have to experience the fire and brimstone, the righteous wrath of God. If we will turn to Christ, if we will trust in Christ, then we will not experience His wrath because Jesus will have experienced it for us. Instead, we'll get to enjoy the glories of God. Now, I'd much rather experience and enjoy the, the glories of God than, than go through the wrath of God. Wouldn't you? 
So he says in verse 7, the Lord is righteous and he loves righteous deeds. And look what it says, the last line. I love it. Look at it. The upright shall behold his face. If we're in Christ, if we're trusting in Christ, no matter what happens to the foundations around us, if our foundation is Christ, then we will overcome death and a grave and we will be with Jesus forever. This isn't the only place in the Bible that talks about this. As soon as you read that, you think, well, I, I think I've heard something like that before. Well, in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. We don't get to see Jesus face to face right now, do we? I mean, we'd like to sometimes. We don't get to see him face to face. But, but Paul says, now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been known. In 1 John 3 it says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears we shall be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Isn't that awesome? If we're in Christ, that's, what, that's what's coming our way. And while God's face may seem hidden in the dark days of troubled times, the upright will see Him. God, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, one of the most difficult realities that I struggle with as a parent is that my children are growing up in a culture that I would call corrupt. They are growing up with unrighteous foundations. Unrighteous foundations. They, they are seeing and will continue to see the consequences of a culture that is resting on sinking sand. And one of the calls that we need to hear today is to stand in the gap. To stand in the gap. Yes, we need to stand firm in vocal ways. Instead of running away, flee like a bird to the mountains. Instead of running away in silence, we should stand firm on God's truth. But we also need to stand firm by being a people of prayer. A people of prayer. In our own strength, we can't do anything. But in God's strength... We can do all things. And we need to be praying. Our children and our grandchildren are living each day as easy prey to a culture that is immoral and is godless. And more and more I hear that our children are living in fear daily. They hear of all the violence that's going on whether it's in their schools or in churches or wherever they live in fear of school violence they live in fear of failure they often struggle to fit in they often feel the pressure to conform and how they look what they say what they believe today we need to commit ourselves to pray for our children and our children's children as they grow up in a culture with unrighteous foundations they need our prayers they need to know we care they need to know that we want to listen they need to know that we want to help now, each of you today I believe some of the youth were handing these out how many of you got one of these there's actually four of these are the two that we have say you are loved and you are not alone. Marsha's place um, is starting a, a ministry to the young people at the schools, both in the middle and the high school. It's a very simple thing. It's a ministry of prayer and it's a ministry of, of availability, okay? Prayer and availability. First, uh, a prayer. Um, they are asking the churches if we would pray for the students. The students that are going to North Middle and South Middle. They're going to Henderson County High School. 
Um, and as we pray for them, also that a group of people from the churches, as many as two from our church, matter of fact, if you're interested in being one of those people, you can see Adini Russell today. Uh, they're going to go sometime this week. They're going to take these and they're going to stick them on each locker in the high school and in the middle schools. And you notice it says, you are loved. And then it says, need help? Text the word home to 741-741. Why, why are they doing this and why do we want to be a part of it? Because, friends, I don't have to convince you the foundations of our country are failing. And the ones who are reaping the benefits of this are our children and Someday, if the Lord tarries, our children's children. And we need to pray, 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 pray for our young people. And we need to let them know that no matter, no matter what it is. See, some of you say, well, you know, my kids would never need this. If they had a problem, they'd come to me. Well, that might be the case. But there's a lot of kids growing up in this world. They, have, they do not know who to turn to. And they don't have somebody that says, well, I love you. They don't have somebody to say, no matter what you go through, I'm, I'm going to be with you. And some of these kids are turning around and killing other kids and hurting other people and hurting themselves. And they need Jesus most of all. They need Jesus. Because if they want to have hope, he's the one to turn to. And so we want to give them an opportunity to know, to know that we care, that Christians care. We care about them. We're praying for them. And they can reach out. And if they reach out, that someone's going to listen and someone wants to help. And so today, part of the response to this, to this message, I hope, is that you will take the time to pray over the magnet you receive. That you'll simply come and bring it up. You'll see there's already piles of them up here. And, and I want us to, to pray. I want you to pray. Pray for our students. And, and to bring these up and leave them here. And uh, Dini will collect them, make sure that, that the ones that are going into the schools uh, get these. But I want you to do this today. I want you to think about making this commitment to be a people that will pray, pray, pray for our children and our children's children. Well, you know, David's advisors, <laughs> they said, hey, maybe you should just run away. Hey, hey, maybe you should just, you know, just close your eyes and pretend like it's not happening. But David chose to stand firm. And so too we are called to stand firm in troubled times. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm on God's word. Our foundation is strong if our foundation is God. Though the culture fails, he is still God. So stand firm. No matter how troubled our world becomes, stand firm. Live righteous lives before a righteous God and pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. Pray for the lost. Pray for our children and our children's children. Let's pray. God, we come to you today. And Father, we know.